Hello dolls. Today I thought I might tell you about my friendship with Graham Parsons. Graham Parsons was in the birds for a short time because Chris Hillman and he had very similar musical taste. And I was already nuts about Hillman as a lot of you might know. He was probably my first real true love. I love Bobby Martini, but Chris Hillman was probably my first grown up love. And uh, Graham and he were best pals and everything. So I got obsessed uh, with the birds way before Graham joined. Then Graham joined the birds and Chris quickly took him out of the birds to form another band, uh, a more like-minded music, country music really. But Graham called it Cosmic American Music. Please read some of the books about him. He's such an important character. Whenever I do my rock tours, I have to tell a lot of people about him. and I, and. By the time my tour is over, they know all about Graham Parsons. I take him up to where they live together, he and Chris, and wrote the second album. Anyway, I'm a Graham Parsons fanatic. And I'm gonna show you first this little picture I have. Uh, this is Hillman up here. I was, you know, mad for him and Graham over here. One night, Graham called me on the phone. I met him, it's a long story how we met. I guess I'll go into it. Mercy and I went to uh, the premiere of the Yellow Submarine showing in Hollywood in a, in a in Sparky's yellow Hudson Hornet. Um, it was green, but we painted it yellow. We spent all day painting it with portholes and, and we wound up on the news and everything. But that that's another story. That night we actually met Graham at that premiere, the Yellow Submarine premiere. Mercy and I were looking around, of course, and we spotted Graham in a nudie suit, well, a nudie jacket, red with yellow submarines on it. I mean, how you can't miss him. So we had to make his acquaintance. We walked up to him, we made his acquaintance, and we became friends, Mercy and Graham and I, very good friends. So here he is um, in his nudie suit. Nudie did not want to make this suit because Graham insisted on acid cubes and downers and pot and naked girls on it. Nudie had never done anything like that, but he convinced him. He's a very convincing guy. He uh, got a star over his head from Polly's mother. He called me one night, to go back to that story, he called me one night and said, would you babysit my daughter Polly so I can take Nancy out on the town? They lived in Santa Barbara, uh, safely tucked away. <laughs> but Graham said, would you take care of my daughter? I was so excited, I was so thrilled. So I went up to Burrito Manor, which is what I called where he and Chris lived, to meet Polly and Nancy. And she's the one who put the star over his head and it's still on there. But my clock didn't show up. So this is Moss, Jerry Moss of A&M. Herb Alpert and Jerry Moss. Uh, he sat in for the drummer, Mike Clark, who sometimes just didn't show up. So that's what this picture is. I went to so many burrito concerts, Flying Burrito Brothers second to their roadie, Jimmy Sider. I saw them more times than anyone on the planet. I miss so many other things so I can see the Flying Burrito Brothers. And people ask me a lot of times, who is your favorite band of all time? And that's my answer, the Flying Burrito Brothers. And they're very surprised. Some people haven't even heard of them. But this was my burrito dress. I wore it a lot. Sometimes it was just me and Mercy on the floor by ourselves. People, so many people, just like Sex Pistols, say, oh, I saw the burritos at Palomino. No, no, they didn't. It was a very small audience. But here's the dress. And it's still in decent shape. And I think it would fit me, even though I put on a few pounds. But here it is. And I wore it, like I said, probably at least half the time that I saw the burritos. And Graham and I became very, very good friends. This is a shirt I made from scratch for Graham. See the GP here? And I, I actually put all the snaps in. In those days, you had to use a hammer and a, some kind of weird tool. But I had made Hillman a shirt because I wanted to show my love. I bled into the embroidery. I was insane. It was my own little voodoo thing. I didn't do that for Graham because we were just friends. But I did do a good job, I think. And I got this from his ex-wife, Gretchen, who she and I were going to do some weird TV movie about rock star wives didn't happen but she handed me this shirt in that I, I who knew that it still existed even Graham had, was was long gone about 10 years and she said Graham kept this in a plastic holder he treasured it so much and he loved you and blah blah and I was just like oh I started weeping like an idiot here's my 
other embroidery on the back. It, the Hillman's was similar, but I, could, I saw Graham in purple and I think it worked out good. I got to see him wear it on stage at the Kaleidoscope, which was fabulous. I've seen pictures of him in it. And I just love this here, this hole here, which I know he happened to burn with a joint. He smoked a lot of pot and boy, was it good. And one night, one of the best nights of my life. You know how people say, there was a certain person I met that changed my life for all time. I have a few of those, which I'm so lucky, but Graham was one of them because he sat Mercy and I down, gave us a lot of pot and said, you've got to listen to some country music. And he played us Merle Haggard, George Jones, Waylon Jennings, who I wound up enjoying, and uh, Ray Price, Willie, all, all the greats. And my life changed forever. My whole musical heart expanded wider and wider and wider. So I'm so indebted to him. Then I went off and started you know, going to their concerts and everything. So Graham was very important to me. Graham passed on 26 years old. He didn't even make the 27 club. He had a lot of money. He would pick up a, a third of a million dollars every year and come back and spend it on whatever he wanted to do. And if you think about in 1970, how much money that was, and he shared it with everyone and bought way too many drugs and he OD'd in the Joshua Tree Desert. And there was a, a, a sort of a memorial for him. His manager, Phil Kaufman, his roadie, road manager, he called himself the road mangler. He, uh, Graham had told him they'd made a pact that if one of them passed on, they would cremate them. He wanted to be cremated, did not want to be buried in a, in a grave, a family he was not connected with, his stepfather, all that stuff. And so Phil and the other fellow roadie stole his body at the airport from a hearse, took it out to Joshua Tree and burned it up. Some of these stories you just can't believe, right? Anyway, there was a sort of a eulogy thing to pay for Phil Kaufman's uh, attorneys and stuff, because he got in trouble for that. And this is one of the shirts they were selling. They sold this shirt and a bottle, uh, a stiff drink for what ails you, the Graham Pilsner. Isn't that something that I still have these things? There's so much more I could say about Graham, but please just listen to him. The first two Flying Burrito Brothers albums, uh, his two solo records, just, it, it might change your life too for the better. And and listen to his heroes too, Merle and Willie and George and Ray and all of them, because my life isn't the same because I got to hear those people and especially Graham though. I saw him one night at the Whiskey and he was singing a George Jones song, She Once Lived Here. And he started weeping during the, the song, he just wept tears were falling down his cheeks and I was always at my leaning on the stage and I was like does anyone see this this is one of the greatest moments in musical history and I was like oh I'll remember this forever and ever and ever I had moments like that that I knew I would remember forever and that was one of them so go check out Graham you guys <laughs>